I'm John Lewis, and you're listening to 360 Degree City, a podcast where we talk to people who are working to make cities better. Our hope is that after each episode, you'll start to see your own city from a slightly different angle. What is a life-size city, you know? Is it just wandering out of my house, into my garage, getting in my car, driving to my car, going into a garage, going to work, and just repeating that ad nauseum? Or is it maybe like interacting with the urban landscape as we've done for 7,000 years? My favorite cities are the ones that have certain qualities. They're comfortable. You can easily get around by walking or biking, and the buildings aren't so massive that you feel insignificant. They're interesting. There are all kinds of things to see and do, and they're exciting. There are other people around adding to the energy of a place, whether a street performer, people on a sidewalk cafe, or people just going about their daily business. And then there are other places that don't quite fit this description. If you've ever walked on a narrow sidewalk along a six or eight lane road, you know what I'm talking about. You feel like you're taking your life into your own hands just by going for a walk. These kind of places don't consider the needs of actual human beings. In this episode, we wanted to talk to someone who is exploring places around the world that are showing how cities can be comfortable, interesting, and exciting. My name is Michael Koval Anderson, and I uh, have an urban design company called Copenhagen Eyes Design Company. And basically, we uh, advise cities and governments around the world on how to become more bicycle friendly. Um, and I also have uh, started now a TV series called The Life Size City. So I'm sort of wandering away from the specific focus on bicycle urbanism and you know through years and years of traveling around the world I'm trying to open up the open up the conversation to sort of more uh, a general conversation about urban development because man it's all about cities these days you know it's all about neighborhoods and cities and uh, nation states are like so last century it really is the the age uh, of, of the of the city so um, yeah I kind of do a lot of stuff like that if I read correctly you actually grew up in Alberta is that right yeah <laughs> oh, the dark secrets of the internet. Yeah. No, dude. Yeah. My, uh, we're Danish, but uh, my parents moved uh, from Denmark in the 50s to Canada. So I was born and raised in, uh, in Alberta. I was born in Fort McMurray. That's a dark secret. My God. Um, <laughs> but I grew, up, I grew up in Calgary. So yeah. 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 Okay. So maybe you can briefly describe that journey that led you from Alberta to eventually creating Copenhagen Ice. I mean, you know, I, I left Canada when I was like 21. I, I needed to go and do other things and uh, never came back um, and lived many places around the world um, in various capacities, uh, working as a journalist, work, doing all sorts of stuff um, for years. Uh, ended up in Denmark, uh, sort of back home uh, to the fatherland, as it were, um, because of some friends here. And uh, what, like 23 years ago or so. And, you know, I was content in my job as a film director and screenwriter and then I just sort of wandered into this uh, this whole bicycle thing because I took I took a simple photo one day 14th of November 2006 I did a lot of street photography and I took a photo in the morning rush hour here in Copenhagen which is bicycle based um, and uh, you know it's just wasn't it's not even a great photo but I put it out on Flickr where I had a lot of uh, followers back then and people were like, and mostly North Americans, they're like, oh, dude, how does she ride a bike in a skirt? You know, it was November. It was just like, a, it was just a, a Copenhagen or wearing a skirt and boots. And oh, yeah, that's, it was the wildest thing these people have ever seen. And I, I didn't understand the question. I thought it was the stupidest question in the world. Like, this is just, <laughs> this is what you do. Like, this is, we're just riding bikes for transport, man. And then I, I, I kept getting reactions because I took more photos of elegantly dressed Copenhageners and uh, it just exploded in my face and um, and I called it a cycle chic and I started a blog and that exploded in my face and then I got curious as a journalist like why are people reacting to this what is the deal and I realized you know in retrospect I realized okay they've forgotten the image of regular citizens on bicycles for transport which was completely normal for at least 70 years in most cities on the planet um, until the car came along in the 50s and whatnot um, and really started to dominate uh, the conversation. Um, so, you know, and then I started Copenhagenize.com uh, to explore, like, why is this interesting to people? How did Copenhagen get to these levels of cycling? And, um, and then that just sort of <laughs> just morphed me into uh, what I do today. So it's, yeah, 
uh, you know, the joke is like from the tar sands baby to uh, to the Danish bicycle ambassador. That's a really weird ride, dude. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, fascinating. And, and the uh, it's interesting when you mentioned the that people have forgotten about it. Just recently, I, I saw a uh, uh, a video. I was doing a little research on uh, Victory Gardens, mm-hmm. and uh, the National Film Board in Canada has an, a, a film from the '40s. And it's, it's this cartoon of this woman and this man talking about starting to garden and they don't know how to garden, but we'll get the neighbors together and they hop on their bicycles and they go to their neighbor's place. And I thought it was like, you wouldn't see that if that was made in 1960 or 1980. Yeah. So right. really interesting. Yeah. No, but I mean, you know, but dude, like even, you know, you're sitting in Calgary, I mean, you know, gr- growing up in, in Fairview, you know, which was a, a, a new suburb in uh, 19, you know, what, 1955 or so. You know, I mean, it was, it, you know, my entire childhood, you know, the, the TV series Stranger Things works because it's real. You know, that was my childhood. You just rode your bike everywhere all day long and you came home when you were hungry. You didn't, you know, there was, a, you know, it, even then for mostly for children, I would say in the 70s and 80s. But yeah, you know, up until that point, you know, it was just the bicycle was just a normal part of our lives in every city on the planet, you know. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's we got to remember that we have short memory loss, uh you know, short term memory loss in, in the urban context, really, in so many ways. But that one, the bicycle is certainly one of them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so with with the evolution to creating uh, Copenhagenize the, the, the firm, um, you've obviously been busy all over the world consulting, giving direction to cities. You've been doing lots of talks, spreading, spreading the good word. Uh, but now you've made the shift to the life size city, the, the TV show. Uh, what what compelled you to to create that that TV show? I mean, you know, my job has you know been confined to 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 bicycle urbanism, right? That's where that's where the company started. That's what we do. Um, but you know, when you when you stare intently at cities for 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 so long, for over a decade, I mean, you you obviously you know you notice other things. And and I think uh, maybe it all started with my network because I meet all these amazing people around the world. And, yeah, maybe some of them are working with uh, bicycle uh, planning or infrastructure or whatnot. But, I mean, you know, then you you meet other people at at, at these events and whatnot Um, and you start, you know, your radar starts to to broaden its scope. And, uh, you know, everything, everything I I think about really professionally and personally, I think, you know, is is about the city that I live in and the cities that I visit, you know, and and how can cities be different? And for me, you know, it started with perhaps bicycle urbanism. We did this before. Right. And now we're trying to do it again. We're not reinventing the wheel because it's already invented. And, And then I really looking at cities in that context, you know, we used to do so many things in cities that were pretty rational, pragmatic and awesome. And we've forgotten about them. Like I said, urban short-term memory loss. I don't know if that's an actual condition, but I think it should be. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> um, you know, and, and, you know, I start realizing, man, you know, we've lived together in cities for 7,000 years, you know. And, yeah, sure, we don't die of tuberculosis uh, in eight seconds like we would have done in the, you know, the 16th century in some European city. But, you know, the whole social context of cities, the fact that we're all – living together and having to live together and having to figure it out and create a better environment. That's just something that has really consumed me over, uh, over, you know, m- many, many years. So, um, going from, you know, the specific job that I do and morphing it into something broader for me is a no brainer. I mean, it's, it's all the stuff's in my head. I've just sort of been limited to speak about, you know, bicycle urbanism and the bicyclist transport in cities once again. And, and so the TV series really for me is an outlet um, you know, to get to get all this out there and to explore the bigger picture, the bigger urban picture, um, because, you know, you know, I, I'm not telling you something you don't know already, but I mean, you know, we're all living in cities now, you know, and, and this is this is the future. This is the next 200 years, the urban reality. And man, we screwed up. We have problems and now it's time to fix. And my philosophy is just like we all did this before. Let's just uh, go back to the future and uh, and. And, and learn from uh, the past. And so the Life Size City is just like, it's just really a, you know, this world that opens up for me and, um, and gives me the opportunity to learn from other people in other, other countries and other cities. Um, and hopefully, you know, channel that down to, to the viewers and make them realize, man, you know, you don't have to wait for top down decision making. You can have an impact on your city. The community engagement aspect of the series is, is, is really 
the most fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, k- kudos for uh, for expanding that, and I, and I think um, the idea of moving to a format or a medium that uh, talks to people. Uh, highlights those those citizens that are really making a difference and and talks to people in ways that they can engage with, not just sort of the expert at City Hall or the expert brought in from Copenhagen. Um, I think it's really compelling. The mm-hmm. just last week, my daughter and I were watching the Tokyo episode. My daughter was busy doing some. Uh, she's seven, and she was busy doing some mm-hmm. invitations for a party, and she actually stopped a number of times and was just watching and then asked a bunch of questions. So it was a really good indication of uh, reaching folks in a way that, you know, uh, a summary report in a project that you work on might not get to people, right? Dude, that's the best review I think I'll ever have for the Life Size City. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you get a kid to stop drawing and ask questions. That's just, I have a friend in Toronto who also was watching some episodes and like, you know, the, the, his kid was saying, dad, can we go out and do some urban interventions? And he's going like, <laughs> where do you know these words, urban interventions? Like, you know, so, you know, yeah, you know, if, if, if it was only on children's channels, I would think it would, it would have probably even a more uh, of an effect because all the kids would be going, uh, yeah, we need to change stuff. And we needed to do it now yeah. and we know how to do it. Oh, you know, yeah. but, um, oh, that's brilliant, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, so what are the, some of the key ingredients, um, that you think make a city life-sized? Oh God, that's a big, hard question to start with. What is the life-size city? I think I'm going to start by explaining where the phrase came from because it's going to, it's, it's re- I think mm-hmm. it might explain it. So yeah, you're talking about your daughter, but, um, I'm wandering around the neighborhood with uh, the Lulu, my daughter. Uh, Mm -hmm. She's now 10, but I think she was about four or five. And uh, we're just walking through our neighborhood, waiting for the light to change at an intersection. And and she was just kind of looking around and, and, and and she just looked up at me out of the blue and just said, Daddy, when is my city gonna fit me? And I'm like, okay, whoa, you know, that's that's a heavy question because, you know, she felt small, right? And if you're a kid walking through a city, you're looking at grown up asses all day long. Uh, you know, your you know, gar- <laughs> garbage cans are like basketball hoops. Of course, you're out of scale because that city wasn't designed for you. It's designed for adults. And um, and I said, you know, you'll you'll be fine. You know, you'll grow your brother. He's you know, he's big and eat your vegetables or whatever. And uh, and, uh, you know, and she says, yeah. And, and then she just sort of looked at me and went, yeah, like I know, like it was like a <clears throat> She didn't know the word rhetorical, but if she did, she would have said, Daddy, it was a rhetorical question, for God's sakes. Um, but that, that made me think, you know, does, wait, does my city fit me, you know? And, and living in, in Copenhagen, you know, uh, a benchmark city in many ways, you know, there are many parts of the city riding my bike, uh, you know, on protected bike lanes with, you know, 40,000 people a day on bikes down certain streets. Um, you know, yeah, there's parts of the city where whoever designed that was thinking of Michael and nobody else. And hopefully everybody else feels the same way. There are still parts of the city where no, it's like, what is this place? You know, weird architecture, no urban context, no, uh, you know nothing, no cohesiveness. And, um, and, and certainly most cities in the world are not life size, larger cities, not at all. Um, Mm. so the goal is really that, that you and I, and, and anybody who lives in a city, regardless of age, uh, feels that it's life sized and hopefully, you know, the, the, the listener right now will think, huh? Yeah. What does that mean to me? Because that's, that's, that's the whole goal is that they sit there thinking, Hmm, what is a life size city? You know, is it just wandering out of my house into my garage, getting in my car, driving to my car, going into a garage, going to work and just repeating that ad nauseum? Or is it maybe like interacting with the urban landscape as we've done for 7000 years? So, you know, uh, the Lulu didn't give me the uh, uh, the phrase, but I mean, you know, I invented that. But, it, it, you know, all credit to her for making me think, you know, wait, do I fit? Right. Does my, I don't have to fit mm-hmm. in my city. That's the key. I don't have to fit in my city. The city has to fit me. That is the urban challenge of policymakers and citizens alike is to make it fit everybody. Um, so what is that? <laughs> Did I answer your question? Probably not. But it is sort of, you know, a, a question for all of us who live in cities. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I think that that shifting of does my city fit me? Uh, lends itself to the conversation about space and private space and public space and and what's in between and those kinds of things because I think that what you described as you know get in your car, go into your garage the 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 tendency over the the latter half of the twentieth century to to lean towards private space 
And then what I think is really interesting uh, that you show in the in the TV show is that it's it's a lot of things you're talking about is public space, but people feel ownership of it. Mm-hmm. Which so it's 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 a nice position on that continuum where it's actually shared space, but people do feel like it's not you know the ownership of the parks department at the city as citizens they can own it. And I think that's a really important piece that often doesn't get talked about is like the actual ownership of space um, from a probably a legal but also a conceptual standpoint. Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, like I think in in the in the Toronto episode talking to the legendary Mister Dave Meslin, he's saying you know this is. We all own it. This is public space. There's a reason it's called public space. If you think about public spaces, you know, the word public there should mean something. This is our space. This is our canvas. And, and yet we, we, we feel, uh, you know, invisible boundaries, right? Um, and we, we feel boundaries where there are none. And then we also have physical boundaries. In Toronto, we're filming uh, and a security guard comes out of some glass and steel tower saying you can't film here. And we're going, why not? This is private land, he says. And, and we just sort of moved one meter farther along to the sidewalk. And he went, yeah, you're good there. Like, what is the difference between <laughs> us? You know, and that is the very North American concept of like, this is private land. And, you know, in the Tel Aviv episode, we have this woman who's just like demonstrably having picnics on, on this pu- privately owned public space. I'm taking you to a picnic. A picnic? A picnic that is also a form of protest. People in the city need to know that they can stop here and drink coffee. You know, it's it's we're, we, it's re, we have to define the boundaries and then, of course, you know, completely smash them and break it down because it's our city and private commercial ownership should not have a priority over uh, our use of public space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was I was just recently in Barcelona. I hadn't been there since I went to school in the year two thousand, and mm-hmm. uh, just being used to the Calgary context more recently. And then going back there, I was just, it, it was stunning how much space, physical space is given over to public use. It's just, it's, it's amazing. And just what a difference that makes. Oh, and men in Barcelona um, and other cities in Spain as well, but like in Barcelona, sorry, Barcelona's in Catalonia, but anyway, we're not going to get into politics. Yeah, yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like they defend it, like it is, they vehemently defend the public space and, uh, and, and, you know, there's dockless bike share now these bikes that just sort of parked anywhere and you have an app and you find them and they're, they're actually getting vandalized because you know they're being parked in public space they just man you know if, every, if anybody could learn uh something from barcelona it really is the respect uh for for the public space um and and breaking down those boundaries yeah absolutely is there a particular uh compelling story or example that really stands out for you that's uh really is, is evidence of a life-size city, and, and I know there's there's lots in in the episodes. Is there one in particular that stands out? I think I think more generally. I mean, when I, we started this show, I mean, the executive producer is a friend of mine, and you know, we just were sitting in Montreal drinking wine, and he says, "Are there, are there any urbanist TV shows out there?" And I'm going, "No, man, because like it's it's all like kind of geeky academics and with you know clever people, but there's no you know there's no." Uh, uh, connection to uh, a mainstream audience uh, when you're all speaking academic speak. And, um, and and so we started developing the idea right then. And, um, you know, I think from my expectations of going around and visiting and, and interviewing like-minded individuals around the world, I think it, what really surprised me um, and continues to surprise me in, in every episode is community engagement. It wasn't even, it was kind of built into the show that we were going to cover that. But man, it, it's really becoming all about that. The Toronto episode was all, just all these citizens, man, just doing it for themselves, saying, you know what, we, we can't wait for answers from them, so we're just going to do this. We're going to start an NGO. We're going to go out and just you know, uh, pick fruit in people's backyards because they don't do it, and we're going to put it to a good use. So to grow from you know a few backyards where there's some fruit to pick to the entire downtown and then some is pretty cool. How many volunteers? We have about 3,000 fruit pickers registered with us. Community engagement aspect is something that has completely blown me away. To, to maybe be more specific, what, you know, it's, it's really in those kind of neighborhoods in uh, Medellin in Colombia. We need to empower people because that people is really who can guarantee mm-hmm. all the solution in the long term. It's, it's you know, these people who have so much less than you and I have, and and yet they still have the sense of community, and they still feel like, yeah, we could do better, 
you know, we're struggling to have running water, da, 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 but I mean, we're, we, you know, let's still work to create a better in urban environment because that will create a better urban life for us and our citizens. That, that insistence on improving the urban landscape, regardless of it, if it's in a leafy suburb of Toronto or the shanty towns of Cape Town, that really is universal. And I find that beautiful and powerful. Mm. That's, that's really encouraging. And I, and one of the things what I've, what I've loved about the episodes I've seen is, is, is just that. And the, the fact that you're focusing on those folks that are um, saying to hell with it, let's make something better instead of sort of armchair sitting back and saying someone else should, or like we talk about uh, quite often in, in our work, uh, in our company of, of uh, people, sometimes we've observed take sort of the, the vending machine approach to, to government, right? I put my taxes in, ka-ching, I get exactly what I want instead of what you're, you're demonstrating through the show of people actually taking ownership and taking action themselves. And that's, that's a really substantial difference than, say, community engagement coming from City Hall, which is important, versus community engagement of we can build this together as citizens of a community. Absolutely, man. I mean, you, you know, really, the, the automobile... And it's sort of encroachment on our cities, really, in most places in the world from the 1940s and 50s. Um, you know, I'm not and I'm not car bashing here. I'm just saying it really has created some some, you know, massive divides in our societies. Roads divide neighborhoods. People sit in their individual transport form, don't communicate with anybody. They have no sense of community. So, um, you know, which we had for 7000 years, you know, like we had small apartments in, in, in most cities in the world, small houses. We used the street. You know, the street was our living room, man. We we transported ourselves, sure, but we we you know we we flirted, we gossiped, we uh, you know bought and sold stuff. We our children played in the street. That it was like the greatest democratic space in the history of our cities. The streets in front of our homes, and and you know the car took all that away. It it it, it you know siphoned us into uh, you know houses with yards and fences, you know, and um and 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 now when we have more people moving to cities than ever before. And we're looking at cities differently than we have in the past century. It, it really is about breaking down barriers, be it be it roads, be it, uh, you know, fences and all the metaphors you, I can chuck at you right now. But I mean, mm-hmm. it really is. You know what? Your neighbor wants the same thing as you, but you never talk to the to the to the lady. So you're never going to know that. Right. I mean, it is. It, we're all in this together, man. And it's going to get more crowded in our city. So we got to really work together now more than ever before. Yeah. And I, I think the uh, the. The understanding and empathy as critical elements of what you're describing, right? So if there's more of us, we have to under- understand each other better. And so again, back to back to my daughter in our our community, we can walk everywhere. Uh, so what that means is it there's a lot of good things, but you know you you're forced to interact with things that you can avoid in a car or drive by in a car. And so you know uh, some of the the homeless guys that are typically in our neighborhood, um, you know. Lots of people would be uncomfortable with those folks, but those horrible, scary people will come up to my daughter after they've panhandled at a stoplight and give her a loony for, uh, you know, a dollar for her, her piggy bank. Oh, wow. Cool. You know, yeah. so so it's it's one of those things that these people are part of our city. And so to actually understand them a little better mm-hmm. is only going to make everything work better, I think, over time. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, like in in, 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 in our perception, I would say in many cities, you know, the, the neighbor is also as undesirable as the homeless dude on the corner. You know, the, we, we've yeah. created that for ourselves. And, and like I said, man, 7,000 years. And then in just really 70 or 80 years, we just turned everything on its head. It's 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 anthropologically incorrect, you know, to live in cities and not know your neighbors and not interact with your fellow citizens. I don't want to interact with all my neighbors. I mean, we're, I'm a human. So there's probably a whole bunch of them I don't like. And they you know, a whole bunch that don't like me. But I mean, you know, finding the common ground, working for the common good, you know, trying to make a better city uh, and a better neighborhood and a better park down the street, whatever, man. I mean, it's this is. This is this is really, you know, it, it's the age of urbanism, absolutely. But it, it, it really is becoming the age of community engagement uh, based on what, uh, all the, the experiences I've had in cities around the world. When you have mm-hmm. something in common with, you know, a, a small family and some guy in a shanty town in Cape Town or, or some, you know, little art, you know, some a guy, an architect in Tokyo or, or, you know, whatever. I mean, man, you realize 
this is an epiphany I'm having here. I mean, you realize that, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're all a community, you know, like you have stuff in common with people that you would never normally speak to in your life, be it the homeless guy in the corner or the guy in the shanty town or whatever. Right, man. We're all, we're all just working for the mm-hmm. same thing. And, 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 and realizing, uh, you know, the boundaries and borders, uh, you know, in the urban context, uh, are, are, are the problem. And it's a problem that can be solved. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're, I think generally you could argue that you're uh, in the change making business from your practice to your productions and your talks. Uh, are, are there any particular tools, whether it's statistics, best practices, framing of the story uh, that you have found to be particularly helpful in your particular brand or, or course of, of urban change making? I, I, I think um... I mean, I think I think my strength, to be honest, is that that I can do this TV series or do keynotes and whatnot. I don't speak like an academic, right? I mean, I just sort of lay it out on the line, mm-hmm. and I, you know, and I can sort of hopefully engage uh, people who would another otherwise not be engaged. Um, but I think I've learned um, that that I, I speak, I say the same thing, I speak the same language, but I have to uh, adopt many different dialects, right? Uh, if I, if I'm speaking to the activists, the bicycle activists or whatever, you know, Hey, you know, we're all, you know, it's like high fiving and yeah, let's do this. Then, you know, if I'm speaking at a conference with, you know, you know, university students, you know, you can sort of give it a bit of punch, but you know, it's, it's, you know, you also, you got to speak their dialect. When I meet, I meet mayors, every city I go to, I meet the politicians and mayors and, you know, that breed of animal, you know, they need, they need to, (laughs) they need one liners. They need data. Like, I want to say, you know. If you put bike lanes in, you're going to make this much money. You're going to save this. You know, they want they want they want the, uh, you know, the sound bites. Right. Um, So I I kind of morph, you know, depending on who I'm talking to. But my main message when I talk, you know, in keynotes is I'm not a cyclist, you know, and sometimes you see the whole audience sort of go, what? You know, but it says bicycle on the program. You know, I'm I'm just a dude who happens to use a bicycle to get around because I live in a city where it's easy, efficient and safe to do so. Um, you know, uh, I often talk about how, uh, you know, the data is important. Um, that's maybe more in a professional context, but like, you know, there's money in this, right? You put in a bike lane or a a protected bike lane, a cycle track, you know, that's paid off within five years because of the health benefits for the people using it. You know, like, uh, the data is really important, you know, telling people that it's not just some, you know, there's still this misconception about urban cycling, like, oh, it's this, you know, left wing pink unicorn hippie thing riding a bicycle, you know, and the conservatives are like, oh, but like, it's actually an, an amazing conservative vehicle as well. It's independent mobility. You don't tell me to go to the gym and get fit. You don't tell me what to do. I can do it myself on my bike, right? It's, it's cross party, right? Um, but, you know, talking about mm-hmm. the, 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 the numbers, that there's money in this and, and this has all been measured, you know, all the hell. I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt about that this is probably one of the most cost efficient transport forms to invest in urban cycling uh, in the history of uh, humankind. And, um, oh, really? Wait, wait, wait. You know, I, I, if I build that, you know, that's going to be a I'm, I'm going to make some money or save some money. Totally. You know, that that also is a game changer when, uh, you know, depending on who I'm talking to. But it's not about the bike, mm-hmm. man. It's about the bicycle's role in in, in, in rebuilding the life-size city. It's just a chariot. It's just a tool for transport, which has really so much effect on, uh, on, on the, on the urban landscape that, you know, it's, it's, it's mind boggling that, uh, we're not doing it quicker, reestablishing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems, it seems that urban, uh, urban cyclists are the, the indicator species of healthy urban environments, I think. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we, my company, we do the Copenhagen Eyes Index where we rank 136 cities around the world for bicycle friendliness just because nobody else was doing it. We thought we'd better uh, figure it out. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you look at, you know, the top 20, man, it's it's all the usual suspects. It's your Copenhagen, your Amsterdam, your Strasbourg, you know. Um, but what's interesting is 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 the cities, the zeros to heroes, you know, cities where there were no bikes left 10 years ago, just 10 years ago. Paris. There were nobody. Nobody's riding a bike in Paris 10 years ago. I lived there, you know, and now it's just it's like at 5 percent modal split for bikes. You know, it's it's a massive transformation. The strangest cities, you know, Vancouver in Canada is muscling it now. You know, um, 
You know, cities like, uh, you know, Montreal has been ahead of the curve for years. Uh, New York, Philadelphia, all these. Minneapolis is now probably the best bicycle city in, in, in the United States. I mean, you know, with that, with those winters they have, there's no there's no excuses, you know. Um, there are no excuses anymore. It's it's just you know doing it and and realizing the benefits, right? And and realizing that you're not just doing it for those that little ragtag group of urban cyclists or or avid cyclists. You're doing it for, and I always say this, like the 20 to 25 percent of the population in any city on the planet who would probably ride a bike, and you know, and if if the if there was safe infrastructure. And if they could get there quicker, if it was actually a quicker travel time, that's the key is travel times. But, you know, we're, we have all these urban citizens just sitting there waiting for uh, policymakers to uh, to modernize with public transport and bicycle infrastructure. And they'll do the work for us once we do it. Right. They'll 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 prove our point. You know, mm-hmm. and, and then we see this around the world. It's not a theory. It's happening in cities around the world. And some cities faster than others, like amazing speed. Other cities are kind of like, ah, oh, we're kind of getting there, you know. Um, and and but we're moving. The momentum, the momentum, momentum is strong. Mm-hmm. Terrific. Okay, so uh, I won't uh, take up your entire evening, but uh, we have one more mm-hmm. question that we ask every guest, and that's uh, if you could share one city you love and why. So I'm going to ask you to exclude Copenhagen because that's like cheating. Oh man, <laughs> um, yeah. Because what we what we're trying to do is uh, just get a bit of a list of good urban examples from around the world over the course of the over the course of the episodes. Yeah, I can't answer that. <laughs> I you know like what is I mean like in a way it's it's unfair that question because you know cities are I know <laughs> I know you know but I mean it's 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 unfair because cities are so many different things right if I can't say Copenhagen at all. Uh, I probably wouldn't say only Copenhagen, OMG, it's the greatest place in the world. No, but there are elements of Copenhagen that, you know, I wish were in that other city. So I always say I have four cities. I have Copenhagen, uh, I have Montreal, I have Paris, and I have Barcelona. Those four. Man, if I, if you, you know, restricted me to living in those, you know, four places on the planet, I'd go, oh, dude, I got the four places. I'm good. You know, Barcelona for, for, the you know the 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 love of public space um, and and you know the quality of life there and the sense of community my God um, you know Paris it's this iconic city but it's it's we all think Paris is so big but it's not it's just a bunch of tiny neighborhoods where you still talk to your neighbors Montreal is just like this this you know epic place in North America where you know in the Plateau neighborhood where I hang out, I mean, it's, it is, it, again, it's community. It's, it's, you know, people do their, their neighborhood better. And then you have all the good things from, from Copenhagen, urban design and, and bicycle uh, infrastructure and whatnot. I mean, now I'm, I'm going to let you down on that one, dude, but, uh, Okay, if you actually said, you said, Michael, you have to go to a city and never leave that city. And that's, that's your last city ever until you die. Okay. Barcelona. They got beaches. All right. They got beaches. They got everything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they got it all. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, okay. Well, great. Uh, well, thanks so much for taking the time. And so season two of the Life Size City is underway. When is that uh, going to be made public to the world? Um, it will be broadcast in Canada in September. And then like other countries are buying into the series. So it's it's slowly leaking out to uh, many other countries around the world, uh, season one. So it'll be the same with season two, but in, in the Canadian context, uh, September on TV Ontario. Michael's work shows that many different factors contribute to making a city life-sized. Finding ways to promote more active citizens can help lead to cities that meet the needs of those that live there. One thing I really enjoy about Michael's show is that it demonstrates how people from all over the world who became frustrated with the way things were, decided to take action and make change. So whether it's finding a place to sit, gardening within the city, or providing proper street lighting to a neighborhood, it shows how residents in a community can really shape a place for the better. Check out our show notes for information about Michael and all of the great work he does. The book by Michael's team at Copenhagenize called Copenhagenize, The Definitive Guide to Global Bicycle Urbanism will be available on March 28th. And hopefully it's going to be the Bible. Hopefully we're not going to have any more questions. It's going to be all spelled out. How to build it, how to communicate it, how to you know work towards a better urban transport future uh, by placing the bicycle on the pedestal that it deserves. The music in this episode and all our episodes is by Sound of Picture. You can learn more about 360 Degree City at 360degree.city. 
We would love it if you rated and reviewed the podcast. It really helps us spread the word and we'd love to hear your feedback. I'm John Lewis. Thanks for stopping by.